Welcome to uh, Jonathan Edwards Center at Gateway Seminary. This is our uh, Jonathan Edwards Center lecture. I have the distinct privilege of introducing Dr. Lisa Ann Winslow. Uh, she is a professor at University of Northwestern St. Paul. She teaches uh, in the Department of Biblical Studies and Theological Studies, as well as the Department of Biology and Biochemistry, which is very rare. That's why she has two PhDs. Uh, a PhD in Systematic Theology at University of Aberdeen in Scotland, as well as a PhD in Biochemistry and Cell Biology at Rutgers University. Her passions are in the area of integration of science and theology, and that's what you will see today. At Oxford University, she participated in workshops and seminars, topics of science and theology. At Harvard, she worked with integration of science and mathematics. So her expertise is just astonishing. Thank you. We have uh, scientists and theologians, you know, all in combined in one. Um, uh, this is why I'm really thrilled to have uh, Dr. Winslow as one of our board members at John Edward Center at Gateway Seminary. Um, she is also a prolific author. I brought two of her books. Um, the, the one book is called Trinitarian Theology of Nature. Okay, uh, it's recently published by her, as well as uh, Jonathan Edwards and Remarkable Analogy, Ontological Theology of Jonathan Edwards. Um, not only that, she is also has published a number of books in the area of poetry. So she not only is a scientist, <laughs> theologian, but she's also a poet. Um, oh boy. <laughs> I met Dr. Winslow. Uh, I have a lot to first, live up to here. This is not when good. She came to the inaugural conference at John Taylor Center. So this is the uh, second time she's been here in our campus. And uh, I remember uh, my wife attended her paper and she was blown away. I said, You've got to bring her again. And here we are. I had the opportunity to do that. So, and she, and she, she had her paper presented and at the Gateway Seminars Conference. And this, you may be familiar with this book, uh, our conference volume. She has her essay here. So if you want to uh, read that, you could read that as well. Um, so um, as I was talking with her yesterday and this morning, I was just struck by how passionate she was about God and his creation. And, and, and as she today, she's going to explore God and creation found in the theology of John and Edwards. So let's give her a warm welcome. He really set me up on that one. <laughs> he really set me up. I better come through. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Chun. I am just delighted to be here. Um, as Chris said, the earlier part of my career, I'm continuing to this day, is I'm a research scientist. Uh, many of you might have gone to the beaches in California and seen spiny little creatures called sea urchins. Anybody know what sea urchins are? I've spent my life studying their immune system, so I'm a marine immunologist. And I love to say that God kept me in the laboratory for 20 years in order to do this privileged theological work that I'm going to be sharing with you. I've been a theologian for 10 years and delighted to come and share this with you. So before I begin, I'm going to ask you a quick question. I know you're eating, but use one hand, okay? How many people here have experienced what you would say is the presence of God somewhere in nature at some point in your life? Raise your hand high. Raise your hand. Everyone, look around the room. Look around. Now, I want to tell you, I've been doing a little experiment for the past maybe six or seven years. I've stopped doing it now because I will ask people wherever I go, if I'm in the supermarket or at my dentist's office, I'm Italian, I'm from New Jersey, we talk to everybody. And so I will say to people online at, say, you know, Target or whatever, I'll say, hey, in, the, in whatever way you understand God, where would you say you've ever experienced God in your life? Can I just ask you that random question online here? And people are, people are really, they love to answer this. Now, I stopped counting at about 662 people. Every single person, bar none, would say, 
well, you know, I, I, I was up at the Boundary Waters in Canada, and I, and I saw the stars, and I really felt God there. Or, you know, I went to the ocean, and I felt God. Or, you know what, there was this one sunset that I saw, and I knew God was there. And so my question as a scientist is, we all, and it's a unified human experience. It, this brings us together as humans. Every single people group in every time period, in every culture have reported a sense of the numinous in the natural world. It is in our DNA. And so the question today is, why? Why is nature beautiful to us? Why is this random cluster of, of dust in the sky we call a cloud, you look at it and you're like, oh, that's beautiful. Or some smear of colors in the sky like this beautiful rainbow, and you're like, whoa, did you see that? So maybe you've had an experience like this gentleman, and I'm going to show you a quick little 30-second YouTube clip, OK? So bear with me a second here while I get this for us. And maybe some of you have seen this. This is the double rainbow guy, but you've got to see this guy. Oh my gosh, it is a double rainbow. I cannot believe it. It's a freaking double rainbow. <laughs> oh my gosh. I've never, oh my gosh, look at that all the way. Oh my heck. It's a double rainbow. Hey, Cal, look at that. It's a double rainbow. Oh my gosh. It's a double. Hey, Cal, where are you going? It's a double rainbow. Okay, so I, I can't vouch for the fact that there might have been some substances involved in that person's experience, um, but, but what we do know is that we've all had that experience. So why? Why is nature beautiful to us? Now, this is an extremely important question, not just for our human experience of the natural world, but because contemporary science holds that there's no meaning or purpose in nature at all that all natural processes arose out of random chance events. And so when we think about that from a scientific and evolutionary perspective, there's really no satisfying answer exp uh, for, uh, evolutionarily for this universal aesthetic pleasure in nature. In fact, early anthropology of humans, if you think about it, finding nature beautiful is really dangerous and counterproductive. Because if you're an early human and you're looking at the, some little spider in the grass and saying, oh, how beautiful that is, you're now open to danger and predation, right? And you're using costly energy. You're wasting energy on something. It takes a lot of energy to find food in the world when we don't have it put on a buffet table for us, right? And so when we think about this from a scientific perspective, there's no evolutionary significance for why we as humans would find nature beautiful and have those wonderful rainbow guy type moments, right? So why is nature beautiful? That leads us to Jonathan Edwards. You know, as a scientist, having a, a secular um, upbringing, if you will, in my education and in my early years as a professor, I was trained at Harvard Medical School and I was a professor at Boston University. And my science and my, uh, my personal Christian faith were parallel tracks that never crossed. I could never go to my colleagues and say, I get this feeling when I look in my microscope, and I'm, I'm learning all these things about my spirituality and God and things from scripture that's coming to me when I'm doing experiments and studying the molecules. I had no one to talk to about this stuff. I thought I was kind of crazy until God called me to seminary, and I discovered Jonathan Edwards. And so in Jonathan Edwards, I found a conversation partner who saw the same things in the natural world that I was seeing. So in this presentation, I hope to explore how Jonathan Edwards answered this question in terms of a theology of beauty, but a theology of beauty that pertains particularly to the natural world. And so if you're new to Edwards or you haven't uh, had any deep dive into Edwards, get ready, put your swimsuit on, we're going deep today, okay? You'll hear a lot of Edwards' words and I hope it will be meaningful for you. And I'm gonna focus on his final treatise. This was the last document that Jonathan Edwards wrote it's called the Dissertation to or On the Nature of True Virtue. And I'll be referring to this as true virtue throughout the talk. And I'm going to offer to you that Edwards understood that the beauty in the natural world that you can see and feel is ontologically real and put there by God intentionally 
to point humanity to God. So now let's begin with Edwards. Two important starting points for Edwards. Number one is, and this is, Edwards was a man of words, and he liked to be very careful about defining words so we knew precisely what he was talking about. So in True Virtue, he says, you know, the words virtue and beauty are very similar. And so for Edwards, he said, whatever controversies and variety of opinions there are about the nature of virtue, yet all mean by, by it something beautiful, or rather some kind of beauty or excellency. So in other words, Edwards is saying that beauty and virtue are synonymous. But we're going to see later he's going to refine this at another deeper level for us. But for right now, we're going to say for Edwards, beauty and virtue are synonyms. Now his second move here is that he said nature, all of nature, everything that we see is a shadow of God's divine beauty. So whenever you see a beautiful sunset or the beautiful mountains out your windows, that God is putting that there to speak to you. Nature is a shadow of God's divine beauty. And Edward said, all the beauty to be found throughout the whole creation is but the reflection of the diffused beams of that being who hath an infinite fullness of brightness and glory. Isn't that just beautiful? OK, so and this is the Connecticut River Valley where Edwards uh, was uh, originated his life. So nature is beautiful to humans because it is a reflection of God's beauty. That's a pretty simple concept. But we're going to go a little bit deeper and develop this theology. So the question is, is Edward's idea grounded in the scriptures, right? Is this biblical? Is it biblical to say that nature can communicate God's attributes, God's messages of salvation to us through the natural world? And the answer is, well, of course this is grounded in scriptures. It's Edwards, right? He's a biblical theologian. Yes. And so one of the key scriptures is Romans 1.20. Now, I want to point out a few important, because I know we all know this scripture. It kind of goes flying over our head until we take pause with Romans 1.20. For since the creation of the world, now there's three important things we're going to see God is embedding in nature here. Since the, beginning, since the creation of the world, God's one, invisible qualities... Two, God's eternal power. And three, God's divine nature. Those three elements of God have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that people are without excuse. So according to Edwards, God is putting those three key elements of God's essence and being into the natural world. Why? Because every single living human encounters nature every single day. And if God wanted to speak to all humanity in terms of a general kinds of a revelation, then why not put the messages of the divine in the very fabric of the, of the creation that God is, that we are encountering every single day in our life. And we know this is, this is all throughout scripture, but also Habakkuk 2.14, for the earth will be filled with the glory and the knowledge of God Psalm 72 and Isaiah 6, 9, the whole, the whole earth is filled with God's glory. So clearly this is scriptural. So now Edward's next move is to say, okay, God, if you put the knowledge and glory of yourself into trees and rainbows and even you know, down to the smallest parts of matter and energy, right? God, you put all that, why? Why did you do that, God? Was it just to display your glory? And Edward says, no. The reason why God put messages of himself and reflections and shadows of himself into nature is because God wants to communicate to humans. God wants to reach to the human. So Edward's move is to say that part of God's original ultimate end, the reason why God created, was to communicate to the creature, communicate the divine excellencies through what was being made. And Edward said, I'm not ashamed to own. So Edwards is owning this, right? He's saying, I'm not ashamed to say that I believe that the whole universe, the heaven, heaven and earth, air and seas, and the divine constitution, and the history of the holy scriptures be full of images of divine things as full as a language is full of words. And you know he's referring here to the two books the book of nature and the book of scripture that we see from the patristics, right? So God wrote two books for us, you know, and um, St. Anselm says, yeah, God wrote two books, the book of nature and the book of uh, scripture, and which one did he write first? 
the book of nature first, right? That's what God created first before the actual scriptures were written down, okay? So Edwards is saying, yeah, why? You know, why should we not suppose that God would make the inferior in imitation of the superior, the material of the spiritual on purpose to have a resemblance and a shadow of them? And why is it not reasonable to suppose that he makes the whole thing, the whole of creation, a shadow of the spiritual world? And don't we sometimes get this reversed? Sometimes we think that this is the reality. Heaven is kind of like this you know, ethereal, kind of maybe mystical. We don't even really think of heaven as reality often. This is reality. Edwards is saying it's the opposite. Heaven, the spiritual realm, is the reality. This is the analogy. This is the shadow of what is yet to come. And so Edwards uh, developed this wonderful system of uh, taking what we know as biblical types. Biblical types are scriptures in the Old Testament that will foreshadow or point forward to the revelation in the New Testament, like the blood of bulls and goats pointed to the blood of Christ. Right? Those are types in the scriptures. Edward said there's types in nature, too. And so he developed a system called natural typology. It was really um, cutting edge and, and um, uh, advanced for his day. And so I love this picture here. If you can see this, I don't know if I have a, I don't have a pointer on this, but if you see in this little picture in the inset, this is this beautiful mountain range and a lake, and you see the reflection of the mountains in the water. And if I said to you, which one is real? You're gonna say, well, the mountains are real. The reflection is water. It's just reflecting the mountains. Edward says, you got it. Everything here on our earth, everything that we're looking at is a shadow of the ultimate reality, which is God, right? And so the type would be something in nature that's gonna to point to what Edwards calls the anti-type. And I have um, furthered this terminology to call it an ontotype, ontologically true. This isn't some Christian thing that we're glomming onto nature. It's the opposite. It's that God ontologically, intentionally, put his images of himself into nature in order to communicate with us. So these are not just random metaphors or poetic metaphors. When the psalmist says, God is my rock, and is looking at a mountain, you see the beautiful mountains outside, what do you think of? You think strength, immovable, long-lasting. God said, I'm going to create this thing called rock, called mountain, that's going to communicate something of my divine attributes to people when they see it. So it's not we're glomming on metaphors. It's that God has intentionally done this in everything all the way down to the very smallest elements of matter and energy at the molecular, cellular um, levels. So Edward says, natural things were ordered for types of spiritual things. And the antitype is the very substance, the true thing that it's pointing to in nature. OK, so Edwards formulates this theology of natural types. And I call these God-embedded intentional guides. They are there for us to use in our spiritual practice and our knowledge of God. And so God has put these embedded intentional guides within the structures and mechanisms of nature as a way to communicate the knowledge and glory of God to the creature. So in this way, we come back to Edward's theology of beauty that indicates that beauty in nature now is an ontotype communicating something of God's own divine beauty, the antitype, to a creature. Why? Why? Because of God's great, infinite, unfailing love for you. I remember being um, with my thesis advisor, Philip Ziegler, and we were on, this was back in the day when we used Skype, okay? <laughs> this was pre-Zoom era. Um, and I had been going through this doctoral dissertation with Philip for two years, and we were working on some very um, deep mechanisms in, in, in cellular vision and in um, other small mechanisms in science. And I was trying to communicate to Phil what I was talking to, that God created the structures. He created the atoms, the molecules, ecosystems. He created everything to function. But in every single thing he created, there's images and messages that reflect scripture. And when Philip Ziegler got it, this was after two years of us talking theologically, and we're on Skype, and I'm watching his face, and he looks at me, and he got it. And he starts welling up, this you know, incredible theologian starts welling up with tears, and he says, Lisanne, 
God is so much greater than I ever imagined him to be. Because not only do, it's hard enough to make the structures as complex as they are, but then every single one of them also has a message that reflects something scriptural. Why? Because God wants us to know him so much. Okay, so what is Edward's theology of beauty? He said, basically, everything that you find beautiful it's beautiful because it is pointing to what's called primary beauty or superior beauty, which is God. And secondary beauty or inferior beauty is everything that is created. So everything that you would find beautiful, nature, art, architecture, mathematics, shapes, pieces of music, right? someone who has physical beauty or style, you know, all of these things Edwards is writing about in, in uh, True Virtue. He said every one of those things are all a type that's pointing to the antitype of God's own beauty. And so Edwards affirms that all beauty is attractive to us primarily on the account that it is a derived beauty, that God intended it to be that way, and to formulate our sort of receptors, right, to be able to receive that knowledge. And Edwards says general goodness and beauty in the most comprehensive view is considered with regard to its universal tendency. Put a pin in that. Universal tendency. Everybody sees something that's beautiful, finds it beautiful, right? And we know that beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and there's all kinds of aesthetics and what makes something beautiful or not. But he's saying all humans recognize beauty. It's a, it's a universal tendency. So put a pin in that for just a minute. All right, so now that we have a grasp on Edward's understanding that all Earthly secondary beauty is really an ontotype pointing us to the reality of God's primary beauty. Edward's next move is to refine or fine tune how beauty is related to virtue. I'm coming back to that number one point from earlier. Okay, so, and, so in his introduction to true virtue, he equates these terms, but now he's going to refine this in typical Edwards fashion. He wants to be very precise here. While all virtue is beautiful, not all beauty is necessarily virtuous. So he begins with distinguishing beauty and virtue in sentient beings. And he comes up with a notion that is very interesting. So this is in people. This is in human beings. I'm sorry. I'm a scientist. I love flow charts. So we're going to go through a little flow chart of Edward's, <laughs> Edward's work, right? So first, we're going to talk about beauty and virtue in people. And then we're going to see what Edwards had to say if this is similar to or different from how we view beauty in the natural world. So first, Edwards, first, his first idea is, OK, let's separate beauty into, or and virtue into two categories. He says, first, we have beauty in people. When you see a gorgeous you know, actor or actress, you know, supermodel, or whatever you want to call it. right? So we're calling this beauty at a glance, some kind of external physical beauty. And Edwards says, that's beauty, but that's not virtue. Because someone could be physically beautiful, but a really bad person, right? They don't have, maybe they don't have any moral code, moral compass. Maybe they don't have any, you know, ways of being nice in the world. They're beautiful, but they're not virtuous. So Edward says, okay, we have to distinguish beauty and virtue in this case. And then he says, well, wait a minute, there's also beauty in the mind. And now Edwards goes uh, even further to now give us two subcategories of the mind, beauty in the mind, and one is objective reasoning, right? So things like mathematics or things that you study. And he says, this is also beautiful, but not necessarily virtue, because it's more neutral, right? However, he says, when, when we look at beauty in the mind on a spiritual level, or a moral or a godly level, he says, OK, that's both beauty and virtue, right? So moral character of the mind, he's saying, OK, that's where we can really equate beauty and virtue together. However, Edwards thought for a moment, and he said, well, wait a minute, because we can have people who are unbelievers, even atheists, who can do nice things, right? who can do virtuous acts. What's the difference, then, between beauty and virtue in the mind and moral character of someone who is Christian versus someone who is not. Is there a difference? And Edward says, yes, there definitely is a difference between the redeemed and the unredeemed, right? Okay? And so he said, I'm going to take this a step further. Beauty, now we go through our flow chart. Beauty in people, in the mind, in the sense of the, of the moral, spiritual quality of a person, without Christ, is just beauty and virtue. But in Christ, he says, this is what's called true virtue. This is the end for which God created the world. 
He wanted people to know him, to be delighting in him, right? And then that delight in the creator re-emanates God's glory back to its source. And so Edwards calls that a special term. He calls it true virtue. So we're going we're to remember that term in just a minute, because we're going to now say, what about nature? Where do we understand Edwards' reasoning in terms of beauty in the natural world? So does this have anything to do with nature? And the answer is yes. Did Edwards have anything to say about the ontology of nature's beauty, why we find nature beautiful? And what might be God's intent in that? And so yes, Edward did, Edwards did have something to say about that. Now this is the quote. It's one of those things when you're a scholar, you know, and you have some thoughts about something and you're studying and you're reading lots and lots of theological material, and then you come across the one quote that is you're like, oh my gosh, this fits perfectly. This is what I've been looking for. This is the quote in True Virtue. So in True Virtue, Edwards links this idea of secondary beauty, what was created, pointing to being in general. Now, Edwards had nicknames for God. I have a nickname for God, too. Do you want to know what it is? Anybody want to know my nickname for God? You yes. do? My nickname for God is the love that created. So I just, that's my nickname for God, you know? Oh, my love that created. It's just such a beautiful, tender way. So Edwards was being in general. That was God, that was his nickname for God, you know, being in general, right? Okay, so in Edwards' true virtue, he links the idea of secondary beauty pointing to God being in general's primary beauty, not only applying to humans like we saw in the previous flow chart, but also in nature as well. And this is the quote. He says, and here, and we're going to read this. I'm sorry it's kind of a long one, but we'll read it. And here, by the way, I would further observe, probably it is with regard to this image or resemblance which secondary beauty has of true spiritual beauty, right, pointing to God, that God has so constituted nature that the presenting of this inferior beauty, especially in those kinds of it which have the greatest resemblance to God's primary beauty. And he quotes, the harmony of sounds and the beauty of nature that they have a tendency to assist those whose hearts are under the influence of a truly virtuous temper, to dispose them to the exercises of God's divine love and enliven them in a sense of spiritual beauty. In other words, Edwards is saying, yeah, God had an intent to make nature beautiful, to enhance your spiritual practice, your spiritual understanding of God's presence God's divine beauty and God's messages to you. Thank you, Edwards, that helped, yes. So now, okay, so we know, and I asked you this in the very beginning and we saw it the double rainbow guy. When you encounter something beautiful in nature, it's a heady thing, you're seeing it with your eyes, you know it's a rainbow or you know it is a sunset, but let's face it, people, it's a gusher, it's a gusher. You feel something inside of you, don't you? When you encounter that beauty in nature, something just rises in you. You're like, wow, right? And so that, that filling of the human heart and soul, this is on a deep metaphysical and spiritual level when you encounter that stunning mountain vis vista, the beautiful sunset by the sea, and you have that here in California. I'm so jealous. Um, even a cool breeze on a summer evening, it doesn't have to be the spectacular things, right? You know the feeling? Anybody here can, can give a nod? You know the feeling that you're getting in nature? Um, thank you. Some people are nodding going, yeah, I've, that's, I've seen that, right? Also, so, and, and not only is it just like when we go out and see the sky and the sunset and whatnot, but this same kind of reaction happens for some of us who study the foundational mechanisms of nature through science as well. There's that same kind of feeling when I study the movement of sea urchin immune cells and I see them on a microscope slide. I'm like, whoa, that is crazy beautiful. So there's beauty, wonder, and awe in the mechanism of science and in natural laws as well. So there seems to be something intrinsic in nature and its mechanisms that elicits this response in people. And as I said earlier, that feeling of the numinous, the loveliness, or the wonder of nature seems to be a universal part of the human experience. And I said, put a pin in it. Remember, Edwards said, this is a universal experience. So God is 
putting this into nature to speak to all people, to draw all people. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. It wasn't just that God so loved Christians, right? God so loved the world. He wants all to come to know him, as in Romans 1.20 tells us. So according to Edwards, what the human creature is attracted to in nature's beauty is actually the communication of God's own divine beauty that is shining from its source or its inception. Now, you realize people may or may not recognize it as such. They may not even acknowledge it as a reflection of God's beauty, but it is regardless. And I had a wonderful experience with an atheist scholar, a colleague of mine, uh, many, many years ago where I was writing this dissertation, he was reading some, we had great debates about the existence of God and you know, the existence of, of God in people's lives and humans and you know, isn't love just neurons firing in your brain anyway? Like, you know, like this kind of like sort of reductionist kind of understanding of nature. We had great conversations, very respectful. And this one morning in Minnesota, the one thing we really do have is we have gorgeous sunrises in the fall because it's cold. And there's something about just the way the cold air and you know, the way the sun rises, they're just spectacular. And this one morning, the sunrise was just so unbelievable that I had to literally pull my car to the shoulder of the road for the seven minutes that you get the sunrise for. You know, I'm like, God, I'm not missing this one. You know? So I pulled over and I just worshiped God in my car. You know, I'm like, God, this is just gorgeous today. Thank you for letting me start my day off like this. And prayed, worshiped God, drove into Northwestern, and started teaching my classes. And then I get this text message from my atheist friend. And he said, did you happen to catch that sunrise this morning? I said, yeah, I did, did you? And he said, I think I'm starting to understand your doctoral dissertation now. Because <laughs> he couldn't explain why the sunrise did something to him interior and his interior self, his spirit being, right? So people may not recognize it as such, but it doesn't matter. This is what it is, according to Edwards, right? This is ontologically real. Edwards goes on to say, for true virtuous principle is supposed to be implanted naturally in the hearts of all mankind. It's there, whether people attribute it to God or not. So Edward says that the whole of the creation reflects not only the knowledge of God, which appeals, of course, to the mind, to the reason, and the intellect of the creature, but also reflects the fullness and glory of God's beauty, which touches our heart, which was our sermon in chapel this morning, right? God wants to touch our hearts for him. Edward says it this way, for as God is infinitely the greatest being, so he is allowed to be infinitely the most beautiful and excellent. And all the beauty to be found throughout the whole creation is but the reflection of his diffused beings, which we read, we read earlier as well, of that being who hath an infinite fullness of brightness and glory. God's beauty is infinitely more valuable than that of all other beings upon those accounts mentioned by way of the degree of his virtue and the greatness of his being possessed of this virtue. However, according to Edwards, a comparison of beauty and virtue in people and persons and in nature are not quite equivalent. And the reason is that nature doesn't have will. Nature doesn't have intent. Nature doesn't have free will. Nature does not have a moral character. Nature is not sinful. Thus, nature, while beautiful, can't be virtuous because it does not have a moral character. Edward says, "'Tis not all beauty that is called virtue. For instance, not the beauty of a building, a flower, or of the rainbow. They, they can have beauty, but they can't be virtuous because they don't have a moral character, right? So a flower or a rainbow or any other aspect of the natural world is beautiful, but it can't hold virtue because it doesn't have a moral character. Okay, Edwards, what are we gonna do now? All right, so he says, all right, let's say beauty and nature, we can divide that into two categories as well. I'm just summarizing Edwards from True Virtue for you. He says, you know, even man-made, human-made things, we're considering those nature because bricks and wood comes from the natural world, right? So humans have recreated the stuff that we build, and the metal and all these materials come from the earth. So he says, okay, beauty in human-made objects, they're beauty, but they're not virtuous because, you know, Metal doesn't have a moral character, so it can't be virtuous. And beauty in the structures and mechanisms of nature are beauty, but not virtuous. And he said that in that previous quote, okay, because nature's not moral. Okay, okay. All right, Edward. So Edward sees nature as having beauty, but not virtue. And many of you are nodding. You're like, yeah, okay, that, that makes sense. 
However, when we unpack Edwards further, we see that a thing, whether it's a person or something in nature, possesses true beauty, true virtue, because it has something in particular. And if you remember before, that word true virtue in yellow, it was because people knew Christ, right? You know Christ, you have something more. Your moral character isn't just your lists of goods and things you want to do, do good in the world. It's your relationship with Christ that gives you this true virtue. Okay, mm -hmm. so Edward says something has true beauty or true virtue if it is in union with the Creator. Right? As Christians, we have union with the Creator. And so he says, and if everything is in some way related to being in general, as his pet name for God, and is part of the universal system of existence, the whole world, and so stands in connection with the world, what can its general and true beauty be? But its union and consent with the great whole. Okay, Edward, so people have true virtue when they are in union with Christ. What about nature, right? So in other words, Edwards designates that all true virtue or true beauty is derived. It is derived because of its relationship with creator, its union with the creator. It's easy to see that for people. So Edward says it is primarily on this account that they are beautiful, that they imply consent and union with being in general, with God. So the criteria for true beauty or true virtue is union with creator, union with God. Okay, Edwards, we're with you, all right. Now, for people, true virtue can be either present or not, depending upon their union with Christ. But according to our biblical scriptures, nature can never be absent from the creator. All of the creation is already in union with the creator, or as Edward says, consent to or be uh, benevolence to the creator. This is affirmed throughout the entire Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation. A few scriptures here for you to take a look at, right? So according to Edward's metaphysics, nature exists as ideas in God's mind that are manifest into reality by a continuous creation that exists within God. Nature is always in union with creator. All of the creation, by the very consistency of what it is, is in union with God according to Edwards' criteria for true virtue, which is true beauty. We know the scripture tells us that all creation came to be, everything in existence came to be for Christ, by Christ, in Christ, and through Christ. Nature is metaphysically in union with God. What does this tell us then? Humans have true virtue when they have come to the knowledge of Jesus. They then reflect God's attributes as a shadow right, to the world in moral lifestyle and attitude, and they have union with creator. But nature has true virtue intrinsically. Why? Because we've already seen that nature reflects God's in invisible qualities, eternal power, and divine nature. Through a metaphysical union, Nature is united with, with, with God uh, through that uh, metaphysical connection with Christ. All of creation came into being by Christ, for Christ, through Christ, and in Christ. Wait, does that mean that nature might have true virtue? So let's go back to this again, right? So Edward says, well, beauty, uh, nature does not have, uh, uh, excuse me, nature has beauty but not virtue, but according to Edward's definition, we might say, since nature is in Christ, it possesses true virtue. Hmm, okay, where might that lead us then? So I'd like to suggest, in extending Edward's argument, that nature reflects the more pure form of virtue called true virtue. Nature is created by God into form and existence without any interruption or intervening corruption. We do know nature reflects receives the effects of sin from the fall, right? Diseases and pollution and so on. Deforestation, endangerment of species. Um, but nature does not need to be redeemed as people do who can hold beauty, virtue, and or true virtue. But nature will be remade in the new heavens and the new earth eschatologically. Nature communicates the knowledge and glory of God and is already in union with God in Christ, according to our scriptures. So nature holds beauty, which reflects God's primary beauty, and possesses 
true virtue because it was given that by its uh, inherent union with Christ. So why does God externalize his beauty in nature as true virtue? Why does God do that? So just as those in Christ shine forth and communicate Christ by their true virtue, so nature shines forth and communicates God by its true virtue also. Both are evidence of the virtuous beauty of being in union with the all-loving creator in Christ. So we briefly revisit what Edward says. Again, we'll finish up in just a minute. God has so constituted nature that the presenting of this inferior beauty, especially in those kinds of it, which have the greatest resemblance of primary beauty or God's beauty, and he talks about the harmony of sounds and beauty of nature and so on, um, that these have a tendency to assist those whose hearts are under the influence of a truly virtuous temper to dispose them to the exercises of divine love and enliven them in a sense of spiritual beauty. Edwards is saying that God has constituted nature as a revelation of divine love and beauty to creatures who will encounter it, most deeply felt by those who are believers and who know Christ as their savior. Um, okay, so in conclusion, I'll wrap it up. So nature is truly beautiful to you when you see the rainbow or the double rainbow guy because it is a reflection of God's primary beauty. Both nature and humans possess true virtue by being in Christ and thereby by communicating God to the world. Answering our question, why do humans find nature beautiful? Because they have been fashioned to receive this knowledge even if they don't acknowledge it as such. And this beauty is most de deeply felt and experienced by those of us who are in Christ. Why, why, and Edwards comes back to that why question. Why did God create the world? Why did God put these fingerprints of nature into the world for us? Because it is God's great love for humanity. God is ever reaching to his creatures in infinite love and mercy. That's all I got for you today. So thank you so much. Yes. One is, is, is Edwards explicitly dependent on Plato at all? Or are people drawn those connections with forms and ideas? And then also, does this, uh, is there a danger of sliding into pan-entheism? Yes. Edwards yeah, thank you. Those are both excellent questions. First, I'll answer the second one first. Um, yes, there can be a danger if we're saying that nature is God or that nature has, is God's being. And, H, and Edwards is not saying that. Edwards is saying, according to our scriptures, God emanates the knowledge and glory of God into the scripture, not God's own being. And so Edwards would be considered a panentheist, where nature is within God, but nature is fully separate from God. So there's a distinct creator uh, creation distinction in Edwards. So Edwards is a panentheist in that sense. And so there's a lot, yeah, there's a lot of scholarship that looks at Edwards' um, platonic views in terms of Plato and um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, particulars and uh, substances in nature. And so it's argued, Chris, you can help me on this one in terms of Edwards and Platonism. I think he's by some considered a Platonist and others considered not a Platonist in that sense. So it's, there's debate in Edwards scholarship right now. Okay. And these terms are uh, very difficult and sometimes, diff uh, what do you mean by this? You know, I think we throw a lot of words like panentheist or Platonist, like what do you exactly mean by it? And we probably don't have time to parse it all out, but I think sometimes these labels, we put a label on it and people mean different things by those labels. So yeah. we need to be careful with that. Because we don't want to box them into some label that Edwards might not quite fit. Yeah. Hotly debate in, in Edwards right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Cameron. Well, Sam, could you talk about, and you didn't do it here. Sorry. I can, great as always. I love reading your stuff. Thank you. One of the things I wish you'd talk about maybe briefly, because it's in your books that I've read, and I think people may find fascinating, is some of your discussion of the microscopic Mm -hmm. Your study of microscopic and the particular thing that you found that those image specifically of God's being or, or divine attributes. Yes, thank you. So I have been working for 10 years at the cellular and molecular level. So Edwards, you know, he's seeing images and shadows of God's divine things in the macroscopic world, right? So he's saying that, you know, things like trees and rivers and spider webs, they all have these wonderful messages that point us to scripture. Um, so I was wondering, you know, do those go down to the lowest levels in the cellular and molecular level? And so I have worked on 10 scientific mechanisms at the molecular level, and 
all the way down to the most minute elements of matter and energy, we see God's divine messages implanted in nature. So if one quick example, I know we don't have much time here, but um, anybody here ever study light at the physics level? I mean, here's the word photon photon of light, right? A photon is the basic unit of light. We know Jesus is the light of the world. And physicists have debated for over a hundred years, what is a photon? Is it a particle? Is it a wave? Well, we can measure its mass, but it doesn't act like a particle. It acts like a wave. And so physicists have decided that photons, which are the elements of light, the, the quantum unit of light, has a dual nature. They are equally both a particle and a wave. And when we look at that, we say, Jesus, the light of the world, has a dual nature, fully human and fully God. That's one small example. And so we've done multi-step scientific mechanisms showing every single step reflects messages from scripture. And so pick up my book and take a copy and free, feel free to email me, but thank you, Cameron. Yep, so what Edwards did at the macroscopic level, we have done all the way down to the very basic levels of science in cellular and molecular mechanisms. So messages from God all the way down to the smallest levels of nature.